بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين all praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to increase our knowledge and benefit us with the knowledge we have acquired. Ameen. Brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our previous lesson, we started talking about the chapter of purification and prayer. We did mention about the importance of the five obligatory prayers. In the hadith, the Prophet wasallam said what means. See, if there were to be a river running next to one's house and he is having a bath from this river five times a day, would any dirt be left on his body? The companion said, no. Then the Prophet said, this is the example of the five obligatory prayers. Allah erases by them the sins, that is, the minor sins. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-salawatul khams kaffaratun lima baynahun ma lam tughshal kabair. Meaning the five obligatory prayers erase the minor sins committed between them except for the major sins. They won't be erased by performing the obligatory prayers. If you pray Zuhr properly, then you pray Asr properly, then the minor sins committed between Zuhr and Asr will be erased. Then if you pray Maghrib properly, the minor sins committed between Asr and Maghrib will be erased, but not the major sins. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا لَمْ تُغْشَلْ كَبَائِرْ Except for committing the major sins. Those need repentance. A person needs to repent from the major sin so it would be erased and forgiven by Allah Azza wa Jal. And we mentioned to you as well that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever performs wudu properly, then prays properly, his minor sins will come out of his body to the extent, that's an expression, figure of speech, they will come out from underneath his fingernails. So look at the merits of the prayers and the amount of rewards one would receive by performing the five obligatory prayers. Even the scholar said, even if a person was amongst those who used to commit major sins. But he was regularly performing the five obligatory prayers. If he were to go to hellfire to be tortured for other sins, then the spots that he places on the ground during sujood won't be burnt by fire. They won't be burnt by fire. So his forehead, his palms, his knees and the like, these spots that he places on the ground when performing sujood won't be affected by hellfire, won't be burned. That's another merit, another virtue for the prayers. No matter what happens to you, even if you are sick, even if you are at the hospital, even if you are at work, don't ever miss out a prayer. It's sufficient as well to mention what the Prophet 
said about missing out the Asr prayer without an excuse. The Asr. Why he mentioned the Asr specifically? Because many people overlook this prayer. So because it's towards at the end of the day, they get busy before night. So they get engaged in many businesses and jobs they're doing before sunset. So they miss out this prayer, the Asr prayer. The Prophet wasallam said, the one who misses out the Asr prayer, that means without an excuse, as if he has lost all his family members and all his wealth all at once. Just imagine in a blink of an eye, you lose all your family members, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, you lose everyone. And you lose all your money as well. So you would have nothing. No family member, no relative, and no money. How shocking, how destructive is it for one to be in such a situation? This is the example of the one who misses out the Asr prayer. So even if you are driving your car on the freeway and you find that you don't have enough time, yeah, you can park on the side and pray. You can find a petrol station where you can rest a bit and pray. You cannot miss out the obligatory prayer without an excuse. The scholar said, it is obligatory. It is obligatory upon every accountable person to perform five obligatory prayers throughout day and night. Since one has to perform these five obligatory prayers, one must also learn how to perform these prayers. He must also learn about the conditions, requisites and prerequisites and the invalidators. The reason why is without learning about these matters, how would one know if his prayer is valid or not? So one must learn the conditions of the prayer, the requisites, the prerequisites, and the invalidators. Otherwise, he would be performing what looks like a prayer when in fact it is not. And the intention on its own wouldn't be sufficient. Some people, you know how they say, yeah, but my intention is to go and pray. That is not enough. If your intention is to go to Lebanon to see your mother that is sick and you're worried about her and instead of buying a ticket that will take you to Lebanon, you bought a ticket that will take you to New York for instance. You will not get to your mother. So the intention on its own is not sufficient. That's why you have to learn. One of the companions at the time of the Prophet ﷺ came to the mosque, prayed in the mosque, after he finished, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Assalamu alaikum. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wa alaikum assalam. Go back and pray because you haven't prayed. That's in Al Bukhari. So he went back, he did the same. Then he came to the Prophet and the Prophet said to him, Go back and pray because you haven't prayed. Then he did the same. The third time, he came to the Prophet. The Prophet said to him, Go back and pray because you haven't prayed. He said to the Prophet wasallam, I swear by Allah who sent you to us truly that I don't know except what you have seen me doing. That's all what I know. The Prophet didn't say to him, what's your intention? Is it to come to the mosque and pray? Then don't worry. If you pray Maghrib for rak'ahs, you pray Subh one rak'ah, you pray Isha five, it will be accepted now. He taught him how to pray from the beginning of the prayer till the end of the prayer. So that shows that the intention on its own is not sufficient. One needs to learn. And some people would be performing what seems to be a prayer for a long period of time. Then they learn. And after that they discover that for the past period of time they weren't praying properly. And then they become in need of making up all these prayers that they have missed during these days. So one has to learn. Now if you want 
to drive a car, you apply for a license. Then you learn, you take chapters, then you make a knowledge test, then you do a driving test. So before they give you the driving license to make sure you can drive the car. What about the acts of worship? You cannot just say, yeah, I want to pray, but without learning and you don't know what you're doing. Even knowing about the direction of the Qibla, you need to learn what are the methods by which I can determine the direction of the Qibla. Not like many ignorant people, when it's the time for the prayer, they just get up and choose a direction and pray to it. And in many cases, it would be the opposite direction or way too far from the direction of the Qibla. So that's not sufficient. Here the intention is not enough. Even if one were to place the intention, perform the ruku' and sujood, yeah, but not to the direction of the Qibla. So it's invalid. When the Prophet wasallam prayed towards Kaaba, he said, this is the Qibla. And Allah Ta'ala said, وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ And wherever you are, that's for all Muslims, direct your face and chest towards the Kaaba. So even if we are far away from Mecca, we need to learn how to find out the direction of the Qibla. Another important thing pertaining to prayers, because you need to make sure you are performing the prayers properly is to learn how does the time of each prayer sit in and how does it end. Now you might say to me, I want to use the calendar. Many calendars are not reliable, I'm telling you. I know from our country in Lebanon, you see like a sweet shop for instance. Sweet shop will produce a calendar. It's like he's making advertisement for his business. You find another factory that will make calendars and so on. Yeah, but to what extent you think they were very careful about putting the times of each prayer? One of the sheikhs in Beirut, for 20 years, for 20 years, he used to put an effort to observe the time of each prayer. When does it set in? When does it finish? For 20 years. Then he put a calendar. Then after him, also some knowledgeable and enthusiastic students also put effort and they checked each time in this calendar just to make sure that's the right time for setting in of this prayer and the ending. It's not enough to rely on your telephone, for instance, to check if you have an app, let us say, on your phone, or you check any calendar. You need to put effort to learn. After you become sure, yeah, by this time, definitely the time of the prayer would have set in, yeah, you can rely on it. You can rely on it. So you need to determine, and that's by observation. The calendar is, we don't take it as a main source to rely on it. Rather, if it was put by trustworthy people who put effort by observation, then we can rely on it by trustworthy people. In the first place, one has to learn how the time of each prayer sits in and how does it end. We'll start with the Zuhr prayer. You know that before the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, they used to pray only one prayer, which is the nightfall prayer. Only one prayer. During the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, the five obligatory prayers were ordained upon the Prophet and his nation. The following day, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet and prayed with him as zuhur at the beginning of its time. Then Asr, then Maghrib, Isha, then Subah. Then the following day, he came and he prayed at a different time, meaning towards the end of it. And he told him the prayer is between these sets of time. 
So he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why one needs to learn because he might be in a desert, he might be in a place where he doesn't have, let us say, calendar and the like. So how does he know the prayer times? He needs to learn this. First, al-zuhr. Its time begins when the sun declines from the middle of the sky towards west. Every day the sun rises from the east and it sets in the west. In the middle way, that's when it is in the middle of the sky. That's called the zenith. When the sun is at its zenith, that means it's in the middle of the sky. So imagine 180 degrees, 180 degrees in the middle. When the sun is in the middle of the sky, that's called the zenith. That's in the middle of the sky. At this point, the time of Zuhr prayer has not set in yet. When does the time of Zuhr prayer set in? When the sun declines from when it leaves the middle of the sky westward towards west. Once it moves from the middle of the sky, the time of Zuhr prayer has set in. That's the beginning of its time. Its time finishes when the length of the shadow of an object becomes equivalent to the length of the object plus the shadow of that object, if any, when the sun was at its zenith. Here in Australia, we never have zero shadow. We never have zero shadow because we are too far south. Same with the countries in too far north. They will never have zero shadow. But those on the equator, at certain times during the year, the sun could be directly above them. So if you have a stick, let us say, one meter long, a stick one meter long, at some times in these countries in the equator, it might have zero shadow because it's directly above them. But that's the zenith time. When it moves towards west, the shadow starts appearing. That means that's the beginning time of Zuhr prayer. As the sun is moving westward, as the sun is moving westward, what happens? The shadow will become longer and longer. Okay, when does the time of Zuhr prayer finish and time of Asr prayer sets in? When this shadow becomes in length, same as the object. So if the object is one meter, then the shadow is now one meter. Plus the length of the shadow when the sun was at its zenith. They call this Zillul Istiwa. So I'll give you an example. Let us say we place a stick that is one meter long. So it's 100 centimeters. And when the sun was at the middle of the sky, it had a shadow 20 centimeter long, 20 centimeter long. Then when the sun moves westward, now it's time of Zuhr prayer. When does it finish? When that shadow becomes how long? That's 100 centimeters, that's the one meter, which is the length of the object, plus the 20 centimeters, and that's the shadow of Istiwa, Zenith. The shadow of Zenith when the sun was at the middle of the sky. This is when it ends. And there is no gap between Zuhr prayer and Asr prayer. So the Zuhr prayer finishes, Asr prayer starts. That's the time of it. It continues until sunset. When we say sunset, we are referring to the whole disk of the sun disappearing from the horizon, the whole disk. If we are in a level area, level land, 
So if we are in a land that is level, let us say in a desert, and you can see the sun is setting, when the disk disappears completely, now the Asr time has finished and Maghrib time has set in. Not like in many countries you see the sun setting behind the mountain. So now you cannot see because it's behind the mountain, but it's still daytime. Now let us assume the land is level and when the sun goes under the horizon, you can no longer see it, it disappeared, then the time of Maghrib prayer has set in. It continues until Isha time. Isha time starts when the redness in the western horizon disappears. You know, when the sun sets, you can see redness in the horizon. That red color after the sunset will disappear eventually. As it becomes darker and darker, it will disappear. So when it disappears, that means the time of Maghrib prayer has finished and it's now time for Isha prayer. The Prophet وسلم, said, وَقْتُ الْمَغْرِبْ مَا لَمْ يَغِبِ الشَّفَقْ The time for Maghrib prayer, so long as, extends, so long as, that redness does not disappear. But when it disappears, now you can no longer pray. The Maghrib as hadr, it's now counted as a make-up, qada. So if you miss out praying the prayer before the disappearance of the redness in the horizon, you have missed praying Maghrib within its designated time. Now it's time for Isha. Isha starts by the disappearance of that redness in the western horizon. It extends until the true dawn appears. Now why would the scholars refer to it as true dawn? Because there is a false dawn preceding the true dawn. A false dawn is something that is vertical. It's like the tail of a wolf. The tail of a wolf. They know it. The Arabs used to know it. And they call it the tail of the wolf. Now, it's vertical. It appears before the true dawn. So sometimes, sometimes, if it appears, if you look from the window, you might see ah, it's already day, daytime, and it's daybreak. You think it's the time for subah prayer when, as a matter of fact, it hasn't started yet. So that light that is vertical, it extends a bit to the horizon, so it's like a tail of a wolf, that's the false dawn. Then it disappears, it becomes dark again. Then you see the true dawn. The true dawn is horizontal, extending across the horizon. It starts as thin, whiteness. You see bright color extending across the horizon. So it's not like a tail of a wolf, so it's across the horizon, thin. It starts growing bigger and bigger with redness mixed with it. After that, by a while, the sun rises. So when you see that white light that is horizontal across the horizon, when it appears, that is the beginning of the Subah prayer, that's the true dawn. Then after that, the sun will rise. So as it's extending, Higher and higher, you can see, subhanAllah, as Allah said, يُولِجُ اللَّيْلَ فِي النَّهَارِ وَيُولِجُ النَّهَارَ فِي اللَّيْلِ You can see like the daylight is pushing darkness now. At night, it's the opposite. You see darkness pushing the daylight. يُولِجُ اللَّيْلَ فِي النَّهَارِ وَيُولِجُ النَّهَارَ فِي اللَّيْلِ Once the Prophet وسلم, said, if the sun sets from this direction, and he pointed to the sunset, and the darkness appears from this direction, he pointed to the east, then the fasting person can break his fast. So if you are in a place, let us say, you cannot see the sunset, because there are mountains blocking your view, however, you can see the east. The eastern horizon, it's very clear, no obstacles in your way. Look at the eastern horizon. If you see the darkness raising up, 
That means the time of Maghrib prayer has set in. That's another way of determining the time of Maghrib. So we do not rely on calendars unless we know there is a trustworthy person who put effort, enough effort, like this one I told you about in Lebanon. They call him Sheikh Ahmad. He put a great effort for 20 years, for 20 years, putting time and checking for each prayer. Not by computers. I'm telling you, especially like I do it on purpose, I downloaded many apps on the phone, and not all of them, they give you the exact time. You find minutes difference, minutes. So that's why what you do to be safe, let us say it's the time it shows you that it started, wait a bit, wait a bit. Then you pray. And don't wait until it's the last minute on the calendar. Before that time, by let us say half an hour, if you pray, you know for sure you are praying within the designated time of that prayer. It happened once in Lebanon. I'm telling you this, it's not a joke, but it happened in Ramadan. In Ramadan, there was a mosque. I know that mosque. It's uh, the view is all clear to the sea. So in Lebanon, the sun sets. You can see it like they say in the sea. So you can see it. There were no obstacles between this mosque and the western horizon, so he can see. He started making azan for Maghrib, and the sun was seen from the window. Someone rushed to the mosque, and he said to him, wait, what are you doing? The sun is still there. How could you make azan for Maghrib, and the sun is still there? He said, on the calendar, it says here, this time is for Maghrib prayer. He had one of those calendars for uh, what do you call it, patisserie shop or whatever, they have them and it says, Anna, it's now time for Maghrib prayer. But the sun, he can see it from the window. He was making the azan like this. If he looks from the window, he can see the sun. That's why even in Ramadan, you have to be more cautious. When you fast 15, 16 hours, so you can wait 10 minutes. Wait for 10 minutes to make sure you do not break a fast. So even you see, for instance, you hear him making the azan and you break your fast. Then they say to you, we have made a mistake. Then they make the azan the next time. And you know that you have broken your fast. When? Before sunset. You have to make it up. There's no such thing, it's not my fault, it's his. So I'm not going to make it up. No, you have to make up that day because you broke up your fast before setting in of Maghrib prayer, the time of Maghrib prayer. So you have to be very cautious in these matters. The Maliki scholars said verses of poetry saying, وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ بِالْوَقْتِ جَاهِلًا وَلَمْ يَكُزَا عِلْمٍ بِمَا يَتَعَبَّدُ Meaning literally means there's no goodness in the one who is ignorant about the times of each prayer. And he doesn't have the knowledge about the acts of worship. So what are you doing? You're copying people in the way what they do? That's not enough. Because there are certain things you have to be aware of them, such as the intention, for instance. You cannot see it. For instance, the intention you make it in the heart, no one can see it. So you need to learn, you must have the intention and what you need to put in your intention and the like. So it's very, very important to put effort in knowing them, remember them. And when you go to a place, there is a great reward if you observe the sun, the moon, the stars, the shadows to determine the times of the prayers. The Prophet said, Inna khiyara ibadillah Allazina yura'oona al-shamsa wal-qamara wal-azillata wal-nujuma li zikrillah He called them the best slaves of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
are those who give great attention to what? To observing the sun, the moon, the stars and shadows for the acts of worship, meaning to the prayer. From the sun, you can determine easily. You know, for sunset, it gives you Maghrib. Gives you Maghrib. It gives you the end of what? The end of Subah prayer when it rises. Before it, it gives you that light in the horizon, the true dawn. From the moon as well, you can know from the moon. The Prophet وسلم, as mentioned in the hadith, used to pray Isha when the moon disappears on the third night of the lunar months. You know how at the beginning of the month it doesn't last for long? So you know how it starts as a crescent? You can barely see it. In some countries, let us say, when they see it, they know tomorrow is the first day of the new lunar month. The following night, it will be bigger and it will last longer before it disappears. The third night, it's even bigger and it disappears at Isha time. It disappears at Isha time. So the Prophet would pray Isha on the third night. How would he know? By the disappearance of the moon. So there are methods, there are ways that a person should be aware of to know how the time of each prayer sets in and when does it finish to make sure that he is performing each prayer within its designated time. The scholar said, it's haram and invalid for one to pray the prayer ahead of its time. Ahead of its time, before its time sets in. So if one were to wake up at night, look from the window, it seems to him that it's the time for subah prayer. He would get up and pray subah without making sure that the time of subah has set in. His prayer is invalid. Even if it coincides the correct time. Why? Because he wasn't sure. He got up, assuming it's time for subah, put the intention to pray subah, and pray when he is not sure that if the time of subah has set in. His prayer is invalid. Even if you are in the aeroplane, you can see, you can observe from the window, it's not hard. You can observe, you can look down, you see, when it's time for each prayer, you can know this. And because you are in a long travel, you know, you can combine between the prayers. So we'll talk about this, inshallah, next week. How to combine between Zuhr and Asr, how to combine between Maghrib and Isha. There are ways to make it easier for you, but at least you need to learn when it's time sets in, when it's time finishes. You need to learn this. So if you pray ahead of its time, as some ignorant people do, they go to the airport, the flight, let us say, is at, for instance, 8 o'clock, they are at the airport, and they say, okay, okay we want to pray Isha now. Before its time sets in, they can't do that, they have to wait. So even if the flight is at 8 o'clock, what they can do, they can wait until the plane takes off, they can pray in the plane. Nothing will stop them from doing as such. If they pray after its time is over, it is valid, but it's classified as makeup. Qada. If one has deferred praying this obligatory prayer until its time is over without an Islamic excuse, he is sinful. As Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Wail meaning severe punishment. Are due to those who keep deferring praying the prayer within its designated time until its time is over. As some people do when they are watching a football game for instance and they say, okay, I'll pray after 10 minutes, I'll pray after 5 minutes. He keeps on deferring, deferring, then the time is over now, he missed out that prayer, he has committed a major sin. If he comes out of this world with no sins except for that one, that would be sufficient for him to receive a severe punishment. 
unless he repents from it before death. So missing out one prayer without an Islamic excuse is a major sin. And if one were to leave out this world with a sin like this, without repenting from it, he is putting himself under a great danger to be tortured severely, unless forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to forgive us, pardon us, and facilitate for us the roots of knowledge to benefit by it, inshaAllah Azza wa Jal, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We say, La ilaha illallah, and make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.